And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Act three, buddy! Act three. Act three. Act three. Yes, buddy, my brother. Before we jump in, I would nice. like to raise a quick question. Something I, I really want to ask yeah. you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I caught on YouTube, like, the top ten comedic songs of all time. And the first one on the list was Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. And okay. I disagree that that is not really a comedic song. It's a happy it's a beautiful song. song. <laughs> it's an upbeat song. But there's nothing really comedic about it. What was comedic yeah. was it being in the context of the crucifixion of Christ. The setting. Yeah. That's what made it funny. But the song in and of itself is a respectably decent song. Not something that I would listen to on a regular basis. But it's a just a legitimate song. It's not a comedic song. What 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 Agreed. say you? I would say the number one song would have to be Yes We Have No Bananas. <laughs> that would have to be number one. Without a doubt. Number two would have to be Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight? Yeah. Number three, Star Trekking. <laughs> That's the top three. Top three funniest songs. I love Existential Blues. Yeah. By T. Burnett. I I I, I went looking for T. Bone Burnett because I just I am obsessed with this bizarre like ten minute song. Which is which starts off bizarre and then turns into a Wizard of Oz parody and then goes back to bizarre. So I tried to look up T Bone Burnett and he's got some uh, right leaning views, which yeah, kind of made me sad. But yeah, it's, no, that, that that does I, really make you sour on a person in a fucking yeah. hurry. Yeah, but. I can see why people would say that Always Look on the Bright Side of Life is a comedic song because it's a Monty Python song from a Monty Python comedy. But also, I feel that you are correct in that I wouldn't consider this a comedy novelty sort of fucking song. Maybe a novelty. Maybe a novelty in a tiny timish kind of a way. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Just because we haven't heard that style of music in a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But, but that's... that's comedy. A, but yeah, I wouldn't call it a comedy song. Just a comedy song. Because that has a connotation. And just the fact that Jack Nicholson sang it should exclude it yeah. from being a comedy song. Yeah. Speaking of Jack Nicholson... Christian Slater's in this week's movie. Nice Yay. wrap around. I commend you, sir. Thank yes, you. Fucking was. Christian Slater is if you bought Jack Nicholson on Wish. Yeah. Hooray. Yeah. So, buddy, it's time once again for this alleged film podcast to drunkenly stumble onto the third and final act of the podcast, and it is said third act wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all-new turbocharged, all-wheel drive, anti-lock brakes, all-terrain, no money down for six months, movie of the week! And this week we continue our summer-long deep dive into IMDb's list of the 100 worst movies of all time with our first Huey Bull film, the 2005 Movie, with finger quotes, Alone in the Dark, number 19, on the list of the 100 worst movies of all time. Now, I would like to start I, off... I am finding that these movies are getting better the, the worse they get. Uh, I This movie is a hot fucking mess, but I enjoyed it. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as Battlefield Earth, 
But I enjoyed it for how yeah. fucking bad it was. Yeah. Yeah, look. Like, car chase in five minutes. Yeah. I was impressed by that. I was impressed by that. And also, the entire plot of the movie is rushed into, like, five minutes of text in the beginning of the film. Like, it's like Yui Bowl is like, here is the opening. I hope you're taking notes. Okay, so there was an ancient race, and there were these artifacts, and there was these e- evil yeah. people and Native Americans, and fucking, like, God damn it, slow down. I didn't bring the cliff notes with me. And, like, and, like write and, down and right there. The five minutes of exposition. And, like, and right there, I'm having problems with this movie, because I'm like, you built a whole government agency because of one ancient civilization? Yeah. You know, I mean, like, that seems yeah. a little weird. I mean, I can I see think possibly <laughs> you build an age, you build an agency investigating supernatural phenomenon that specializes in ancient civilizations. Yeah. And this story is focused on... No, no, they, they did it all for this, this one ancient civilization. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I... Uh, before we get to talking about the movie, I want to talk about Terry Pratchett. Okay. Author Terry Pratchett... A, a lot of people have been trying to attach him to, like the anti-trans community online. Yeah. It's a big fucking mess because uh, J.K. Rowling is like, hello, I'm J.K. Rowling. I created the Harry Potter series and I'm the most successful writer on Earth. And uh, I've decided that I'm so successful that I'm too successful. So fuck trans people. And now people are like, fuck. So yeah. we got to not give a shit about Harry Potter. What other thing should we care about that's Harry Potter-esque and kind of fun and funny and, and really nice. And so a bunch of Terry Pratchett fans are like, hi, let me tell you about Discworld because it's fucking wonderful. <laughs> and I've read about 80% of the books and there's a shit ton of books. I've read about, I'd say 75% of the books. I, because I, 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 I tried and I, I just... I recognize his genius. I just can't wrap around his stories, you know? And yeah. I kind of yeah. have a suspicion because what he is doing is very close to what I'm trying to do at getting a very strange and different look at things. And I think that that for some reason yeah. puts me off to him. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. I get like that. If I'm, like if but I'm so... trying to do, like if I'm trying to do something artistically, and I run across something similar, I kind of have to keep away from that similar thing, or it's gonna like taint what I'm yeah. doing. You know, so like. Yeah, I get that. I was looking around on various occult subjects, and had reason to look look up Baba Yaga. And immediately had to stop reading because it's like, all right, that's just way too close to the Nettie fucking Braxton. I don't want to know about it. So anyway, there was a tangent. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, So Discworld is amazing and it's, it's a really great world and I really like it. And but because so many people online have been trying to get Harry Potter people to go to Discworld instead because the author of Harry Potter is very anti-trans. All of the anti-trans people that are out there are like, well, Terry Pratchett also hated trans people. And the Discworld fans are like, no, he did not. And you're only saying that because the the man is dead and he can't say how fucking wrong you are Fuck off and leave Terry Pratchett's corpse alone, you yeah. fucking monsters. So I've been thinking a lot about uh, 
the the Terry Pratchett and the Discworld universe. And I, I found a great connection between Discworld and this week's movie, Alone in the Dark. So FYI, this all ties together. One of my favorite characters who appears in essentially every book because of who he is, is the Angel of Death. His, he speaks all in caps, which I appreciate. Yeah. They did... Uh, they have done a few animated movies, which I tracked down on DVD when I used to work at the bookstore. And uh, I had three of them. I had three of, of like, mini series done in a cartoon format for the BBC at some point in time. Uh, animated mini series based on Discworld books. And the thing that I love about them is that in those books, uh, the narrator's death, and he's voiced by Christopher Lee, and it's such a good voice for death, you know? And they make it deep and got some bravado in it, and so I really love the character of death. He's been the 100% focus on a couple of books. There's, yeah. uh, there's a, a book that I felt that... Uh, that came before the nightmare before Christmas, where uh, death decides to be Santa one year. Okay. Except they don't have Santa in the Discworld, but they have the Hog Father, who comes every Hog's watch yeah. Eve and gives presents to kids. So death decides to be the Hog Father. A lot of Discworld fans read it every Christmas, and it's a big deal, but. The thing that I like about the novels is that you hear death talking and it's really, oh man, it, like you're a bartender and suddenly you hear, bartender, I would like a drink. And you hear it in your soul, yeah. the person talking to you. And you look to see who it is and you see no human who is alive can fully focus on death because death is something that only dead people can see. So death tries to talk to normal people and can talk a little bit to them, but they don't really see death. They see a shadow. They see a haze. They see a, an outline. They see darkness, but they never actually see death because they're living. So that's Alone in the Dark, because I saw this three times. I couldn't tell you who any of these fucking people are, what they're fucking doing, or 50% of the goddamn plot, because this movie is death. It's impossible to focus on anything that's happening in this piece of shit fucking movie. <laughs> I watched it three times. I couldn't tell you who Christian Slater plays. I couldn't tell you who fucking Tara Reid plays. I couldn't tell you who Stephen Dorff. What? How did you manage that casting coup? He's so busy. Yeah. I couldn't tell you what this movie was about. I couldn't tell you. Native Americans and some portal and these monsters, and they are inside people. And Christian Slater lost his memory. He was in an orphanage, he, and now he has fucking powers. Couldn't fucking tell you. Could not fucking tell you. Looking at this movie is like in the disc world trying to look at death. I... I was you able cannot. to follow it to a certain point, and then it went completely off the rails. Now, I will generally watch a movie that we're going to cover two or three times if I'm really missing the point to the movie. You know, I wasn't paying enough attention, I got distracted by something else when I was watching. A, a lot of shit, and I'll watch it again. But fuck this, no. This movie had one goddamn chance. You know, I'm sorry. So, yeah. there was a point, I carried the plot to a point, then I lost it, and I didn't give enough of a fuck to go back looking for it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so uh, I was going to save it for the end, but I'm going to do it now. I have a game. Okay. It's game time here at the Pope on Film. They released a soundtrack for this. Okay. And it's a two-CD soundtrack, which I don't get 
Because it's not like this film was wall to wall music. This wasn't once upon a time dot 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 in Hollywood. No. But but yeah, the soundtrack is full of a lot of generic death metal bands. And so I have a list of 10 band names, Bunny, and you have to guess if it's a real band from the Alone in the Dark soundtrack or just some shit I made up or some shit that I took from something else that exists. Okay. 10 bands. Are you ready, Bunny? Yes. Okay. Number one. (laughs) These are all great. Dying Fetus. Take all the time you need. This is kind of hard. I'm going to go real band. You are absolutely right. Absolutely right. Because I Uh, personally would... Had I had a band, I I think that I would love that name. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Number two. Robot Apathy. It's a cool fucking name. I'm going to go no. You are right. It is fake. Mal- it's cool as shit, though. Copyright yeah. that shit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Robot apathy. Malformed souls. I'm going to go true. That is fake. I made that up. I thought it sounded neat. It was uh, borderline. Okay, this is number four. Between the Lions. I'm going to play the odds and go true. No, that's a PBS show that my kids used to love. Damn it. That was a fucking kid show with these lion puppets and they're in a library and it teaches you about reading. I was I was going off the theory that when you're taking a multiple a multiple choice test with the number two pencil yeah. and you're sitting there and you're thinking about the answer and it's like it just can't be C again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how I fuck with people when I do these games. Between the lions, between the covers of a book. Between the lions. Loved that fucking show. Well, that's why I said I was going to play the odds, because, like, it just just seemed it couldn't be false again. Yeah. Uh, Bloodbath. This is a generic enough one that, like, shit. There's got to be a band called Bloodbath out there somewhere. Yes, but is there a band called Bloodbath that does a song on the Alone in the Dark soundtrack is the question. That's that's the tough part. Yeah. I love these games. Um, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, there is. Okay, yes, Bloodbath. They have a song on the Alone in the Dark soundtrack. Number six. Fear Factory. I'm kind of thinking, yeah. I don't know. I, I I know there was some really odd musical choices. Yeah. And I could picture something a little on the synth pop side. I just don't recall what it is. So I'm going to go, yeah. Mm-hmm. You are absolutely right. Fear Factory is the name of a band who has a song on the Alone in the Dark soundtrack. I thought that might throw you because that's also the name of a show that Joe Rogan used to host back in the day. Before he was a douchebag with a podcast. Well, it's what it's what somehow Gary Newman started getting called. Yeah. As a part of like like in cars and I'm praying to the aliens. I know them as as Gary Newman songs, and somewhere along the line they became Fear Factory, and I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number seven, Stump Grinder. Stump Grinder, yeah, they're an all-amputee band. 
Uh, that is fake. That is the fake metal name. That is the fake metal band that my brother came up with when uh, we used to go drinking at the dirt bar. He wanted to tell chicks that he was in a band, a metal band. So he came up with a fake metal band name to try and impress chicks. And so he was looking for a fake name for a band. And then he saw an ad for uh, a tree cutting service that announced that they did have their own stump grinder. <laughs> grind the tree stumps and he said that's my fake band name stump grinder so i stole that from my brother uh that's number seven that is a fake band number eight do scented do scented do scented it's a tricky one because this doesn't sound like a metal band but that might be why it's a metal band name. Yeah, but I keep hearing the music from douche commercials. Yeah, yeah, do scented kind of throws you off. Yeah. Because I, I personally feel fresher just hearing it. And also every, like, hardcore soundtrack always has the, like, one ballad that's usually at the end of the soundtrack. Like you have the crow soundtrack, but then at the end there's it 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 won't rain all the time. Yeah. The like touching end credit ballad. So for all we know, Do Scented might have done love theme for Alone in the Dark. Yeah. Yeah, let's or, go true. Okay, it is true. It is true. Uh, number nine, raunchy. Okay. Yes, but only because I could see the font in my head. Yeah, Ronchi's real. Number 10, vivisections at dusk. I'm going to say yes because I want it to be true. No, I came up with that. That's <sighs> badass, though, isn't it? Vivisections huh? at dusk? Yes. That's a fucking great name. Yeah. Okay. So that was fun. Um, Steven Dorf, real mark of quality. Tara um, Reed, I, I am so happy that he is too good to be in a Black Widow Marvel movie. I, I am so glad that Steven Dorf is doing so fucking well in his career that he could look down his nose at any part of the Marvel Universe. Yeah, yeah. I would now like to do a short play that I wrote called Martin Scorsese Goes to McDonald's. So, here's the McDonald's, and then Martin Scorsese enters, and I'm the employee. Hi, welcome to McDonald's. How can I take your... The Marvel movies aren't movies! Yeah! <laughs> They're not movies. They're not really movies. They're not. They're not film. They're not cinema. Yeah. Okay, sir. Well, this is a McDonald's. What would you like to order? Nothing. I just wanted to tell you that. And then he leaves and goes to the Wendy's next door, and you can hear it. Hi, welcome to Wendy's. I'm going to take care. The Marvel movies are movies! And scene. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tara Reid as an archaeologist is fucking laughable. Yes. Yes. And I read in some I review, had the same feeling about Tara Reid that I had from the scientist girl from that Plan 9 movie with the great Mr. Lobo. Yeah. Uh, yes. Like, I am just so not buying into you as a scientist. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Agreed. not. Agreed. And uh, generally what I you read... say that scientific is just words strung together. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. It's all and, like, and it's then... all like quantum time distillation. You know? Just like 
Yeah, it's just, it's nonsense. It's made up words. You're just yeah. you're just throwing shit together in the hopes that it sounds scientific. But my then, favorite, my favorite goddamn Tara Reed line. Keeping in mind that she's a scientist, and they figure out the that, all the, Ed? that all the pieces of these artifacts were scattered to what would have been considered at the time the four corners of the world. This scientist has to ask, well, that's kind of strange behavior if they want us to solve this puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wow, you are so way off the point. <laughs> yeah. But the saddest part of this movie is the fact that it stars Christian Slater. Because from 1989 to like 1996... I really thought he was one of the coolest motherfuckers on the planet. Yes. Yes. And he, he had did some string. good work. He had a string of success. Heathers, pump up the volume, cuffs, which no one remembers, but I remember really liking when it came out. True romance, interview with the vampire. Yeah. It wasn't even going to be an interview with the vampire. It was going to be a uh, 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 phoenix, River Phoenix. But then he died, which is rude. And so Christian Slater came in. So and the bit part in Star Trek, uh, in Star Trek, whatever, the undiscovered country. The yeah, the undiscovered country, and he he played a wasn't boy. asked to be in that. Yeah, and he didn't ask to be in that movie. He, he, no one asked him to be in that movie. He asked if he could be in that movie because apparently he was a huge fucking Trekkie. And he was like, they're making a, a, a Star Trek movie. This might be the last one with the original cast. I have to be in this. And yeah. that was another thing of like, damn, Christian Slater, you're so fucking cool. Yeah. I can't imagine someone as successful as you begging to be in a Star Trek movie. Fucking, you're so awesome. He was the shit. And now he's one of the worst parts of a Yui Bowl film. Like, fuck! What exactly happened? I don't Where know. Where did he derail? I don't know, but fucking... <sighs> narration in a movie... Yeah. Sometimes it's good. Yeah. But a lot of times, that's just a crutch for a bad fucking screenwriter. Yes. And instead of showing you how someone feels, they'll just say, I was trepidatious about continuing on this adventure. And it's like, okay, you couldn't show us that. to so say you have to have the character say it in a fucking narration. Yeah. Okay, so I think I fucking figured out why this movie is the way that it is. And in order to do that, we need to talk about the director, Yui Bowl. I, I, my, my theory, real quick, is that Yui Bowl just doesn't have a soul. Okay, my theory, I think, is 100% correct and has to do with Steve Martin indirectly. So, just. Uh, hear me out, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, Yui Boll is a German filmmaker who rose to prominence in the 2000s for making extremely fucking horrible movies based on video games like Blood Rain, In the Name of the King, Alone in the Dark, House of the Dead, which was the first one that he did, and that one has video game scenes in the movie which I think would be the video game movie equivalent of Ang Lee's Hulk. Okay. Remember when Ang Lee did the Hulk movie and it's like, ooh, comic book panels. What? Boom. Yeah. Ah. And it's like, we understand what you're trying to do, Ang Lee, but also, fuck off. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also, let's not forget, Yui Bull made the film Postal, which I 
fucking hate with a deep-seated fucking passion. I think it's one of the worst movies of all time. Certainly, I think it's one of the worst comedies of all time. And it goes out of its way to offend people. And it opens with two terrorists on one of the planes about to head into the World Trade Center. And it's like, oh man, can't wait to get those uh, 73 virgins. Uh, here's a painting of Allah. I'm going to shit on the American flag. Eleven was a joke. I'm trying to offend as many people as I can with one film because the directors hate me, so I'm going to go out of my way to make the worst movie of all time only as a fuck you to my critics, whom I can't stand the slightest bit of criticism like Donald Trump, so I'm going to make the worst <laughs> movie of all time specifically to offend and my who are and but people will love it because there's a lot of people out there, cough, cough, sit, head, white men, who love the movie Postal. And I think that says, if you're a big fan of Postal, I'm sorry to offend you, but also being a fan of Postal says a lot about who you are inside. Really? I've never seen Postal. It's a fucking piece of shit. Dave Foley is naked in it. It's it's so bad. But it's supposed to be bad because Yui Bowl is like, I'm making all of these films which are obviously great and for some reason stupid critics who are idiots hate it. So what I'm going to do is go out of my way to make the worst film of all time that will piss off everyone. And it, it's, it's a real piece of shit. It's a real piece of shit film. But it's a piece of shit on purpose. So a lot of like toxic dudes are like, oh, Postal, I love Postal. Have you seen Postal? You haven't seen Postal? You have to see it. It's fucking crazy, man. It's the worst. I love it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to also talk to me for 20 minutes about uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker? So I was worried that we would have to watch Postal for this for this uh, movie, but thankfully it's been knocked off of the IMDb bottom 100, so oh. we don't have to watch it. It's not on the list anymore. Thank fucking God. Okay. So, um, and the thing that makes Yui Bowl such a piece of shit is that, okay, Ed Wood makes Plan 9 from Outer Space. He doesn't have a big budget. He's making it with whatever he can. And he understands the limitations of the film. So when he puts the film on and people are watching it and they're laughing, he's like, well, hey, uh, Edward's laughing too. And it's like, yeah, well, Lugosi doesn't even fucking speak in the film. And yeah, that is just a shower curtain separating the cockpit from the rest of the plane. Because there is no rest of the plane. We had no budget. I understand it. This part's fucking funny, too. And Ed Wood is laughing right there with the audience. Yes. But Yui Bowl, like Donald Trump, isn't man enough to admit his failure as a filmmaker. It's always someone else's fault. His movies suck. Oh, you didn't like my film? Worst movie you ever saw? Ed Wood's like, worst movie you ever saw? Well, my next one will be better. Yui Bowl is like, worst film you ever saw? Oh, well, you're a film critic, and film critics are all pretentious pieces of shit. Of course you don't understand my art. My next... It, it, I, he literally said about his film, House of the Dead, and I quote, I made a perfect House of the Dead movie. Okay. So if you if you don't like it, then then you just don't understand my art. I made a perfect film. What's wrong with you that you don't like my film? I, and then I, I kind of like bad I, I kind of like House of the Dead. Uh, for just how goofy and weird and bad it is. Yeah, but he would never admit that it's goofy and weird and bad. It's a perfect movie. Me, and it's hilarious and it's wonderful and it's a great film and like oh I like House of the Dead because it's such a 
a bad movie. That's a, it's a lot of fun. No, it's not a bad movie. It's a perfect movie. What the fuck is wrong with you, you retard? That is his words, not mine. Yui Bowl calls a lot of his critics the R word, and it's not fucking cool. Yeah. Just want to be clear. He made House of the Dead and that bumped, and then he made Alone in the Dark and that bumped. And so what he did was he sued the film distributor Romar saying it's their fault that the movie was bad. And also, uh, uh, House of the Dead, people said it was one of the worst movies of all time. You know why people are saying that? Because uh, video game fans expect too much of a video game movie. So really, this is actually a great movie. It's just a fan of the video game's fault for not understanding how wonderful this movie is. It's well, always okay, someone else. Well, well I know nothing of the video game, so we get rid of that criticism. Yeah, when Harry Knowles wrote a scathing review of Yui Bull's films, Yui Bull called him a fat retard, in his words, not mine. He's such a toxic piece of shit that in 2006, and this is 100% true, Yui Bull started challenging his critics to 10-round boxing matches. Yes. How fragile of a fucking ego do you have to fucking have? That you challenge your critics who say, I don't think this movie is good. And he's like, well, if you're a fucking man, then you'll fight me in a fucking boxing or boxing ring. And it's like, <laughs> no, fuck you, you piece of shit. He is literally the Donald Trump of filmmaking. The only good thing that Yui Bull ever did is give up his movie career to be a, uh, a, a chef. Now he, you know, uh, owns a restaurant and is trying to open a chain of restaurants. Basically, he's Nazi Guy Fieri. So uh, the, best thing, the best thing that Yui Bull ever did in his career was decide, maybe instead of making movies, I should flip fucking burgers. Good job, Yui Bull. You made your first good decision as a filmmaker and stopped making fucking movies. Yeah. Fuck you. But here's the thing. This, this leads me perfectly to my theory as to the problem with this film. Uh, a screenwriter named Blair Erickson wrote the first draft for the Alone in the Dark movie. It was very dark and serious, and it leaned into the supernatural aspect of it the supernatural aspect of these, oh, what are these monsters? And it was very Lovecraftian and it was very dark and it was very serious. Then Yui Bowl took the script and literally said, where are the fucking car chasers? Yeah. If I'm making, if I'm gonna make a big budget action film, it needs car chases. There's no car chases in it. I need a car chase in the first six minutes. The fuck is wrong with you, you piece of shit? And he got the script and rewrote it into, and this is my theory, a poor man's attempt at a Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm going to make a movie, but if I'm going to make a movie, but, but here's the thing, he's German, so it's like, if I'm going to make a movie, I need it to be big American film. Put in CG monsters, put in a sex scene. I need Matrix-style gunplay. And it's like, okay, but there is, this is based on a video game, and it's like, I don't care, more Matrixy. This needs to be big, American Hollywood blockbuster. This is a German man's very bad impression of what he thinks American audiences want. Basically, this movie is the wild and crazy guys of cinema. Steve yeah. Martin and Dan Aykroyd are Americans. So we have put on our disco pants with tight bulges and we have chain like you Americans like to do. We are American people. And that is what this movie is. And it's like, we, oh, I do American video game? Okay, car chase, uh, explosion. Uh, we need big yes, monsters exactly, in the dark fighting exactly. people. And that's basically what this is. Like, like you're doing it off of a checklist. 
Like, you're doing yeah. it off of a checklist and not bringing any heart to the production. And it, and it gives it... Right. As a film, it gives it a very mechanical look. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're in one place, yeah. and then you're in another place, and there is no texture, contextual reason, necessarily, for why you're now in this other place. You know? Yeah. Which this is part of... This entire movie is... This entire movie is some random German guy saying, I can be Michael Bay. Yeah. But you can't be Michael Bay. But this is a random German man's attempt at a Michael Bay movie. I, I lost I lost the thread of the plot when the the dog creature appeared in the museum or the library or whatever the fuck it yeah. was. I lost yeah. it there because they were kind of like battling this thing and then we went to another scene and we went to another scene and I was like, wait a second. Don't we have to get back to that dog creature? <laughs> What happened to it? Yeah. I have no idea. I, and frankly, I don't fucking care. You know? And also, and also, my personal opinion is that all of Huey Bull's films were just scams because uh, allegedly, this movie cost $20 million to make. Well, then why does it look and feel exactly like a first season episode of X-Files? Yeah. And the this effects scene, are fucking awful. It was like when, like in season one, when X Files were just a monster of the week show. Yeah. Uh -huh. Before they got plot and reoccurring characters. Back when it was just okay, it's season one of X Files. Just here is the monster of the week. Let's do it. Let's wrap it up. Wrap it up, B. Like this, this, I, I don't think this movie cost $20 million. I think it reeks, I think this movie reeks of the same financial problems that plagued uh, Battlefield Earth, is what I think. I'm not saying that this is what happened. This is my own personal feelings. I feel that Yui Bull was skimping off the top. Yeah. I think this, I think this entire movie was the producer's. I think every film Yui Bull made was his attempt at doing a real life The Producers. Yeah. And it's like, hey, I've collected $20 million. Now I'm going to make this film as cheaply as possible. And what, it bombed? Oh, sorry, we lost all of your money. <laughs> Don't question it. There you go. That's my theory. But this is a man who is attempting to be... Uh, attempting to be a Hollywood blockbuster guy badly, yeah, very badly. When when Yui Bull was was uh, uh, trying to get uh, critics to agree to get into boxing matches with him, he also challenged Quentin Tarantino and Michael Bay. Yeah, that's how fragile of an ego Yui Bull has. That he was like. Quentin Tarantino says my movies are bad. Well, he is a dumbass retard, and if he was man enough, he would fight me in the ring, just like stupid Michael Bay is a piece of shit. And then they interviewed Michael Bay about Yui Bull, and he said, and I quote, I hate Michael Bay, but I got to give him respect because he said, I honestly have had no idea who Yui Bull is until a few days ago. <laughs> And it's like, oh, fucking, okay. Your movies are shit, but good job, Michael Bay. Yeah. That is exactly how you answer that. Anyway, this movie allegedly cost $20 million to make. It made $12 million worldwide and is considered one of the worst films of all time. The acting is shit. The script is horrible. Uh, and I sincerely hope that Yui Bull sticks to flipping burgers. Because yes. for the life of him... He can make movies that are entertaining in a bad way, but not good movies in a good way. Yes. And just like Trump, like, dude, 
you should just admit you failed. Just admit you failed. Stop making excuses. Oh, the Chinese and the Italians and Cesar Chavez uh, stole the votes. And, oh, I actually won by 80 bajillion points. No, you fucking lost. You fucking lost over there. You lost. And you over there made shitty movies. Just admit it. Yeah. Okay? And then I, we can all fucking... I, I, I enjoyed some of the stupid elements that I found in this movie until I lost interest. Okay? Yeah. One. First... Yeah. Do you really need the car chaser? Has anybody thought of getting out of their car, walking up to the other car, and being like, look, I know you're following me, and then stab their radiator three or four times? You know? Yeah. And get on with your day. But anyway, yeah. okay, we have to have a car chase. Great. Whatever. You have to have a fruit stand in the car chase. And you have to have a fruit stand. I'm pretty sure that's a law. You have to have a fruit stand. Yeah. But anyway, even if it's lumber. But anyway, now now the bad guy is chasing you on foot. You have shot him twice. He is still after you. Okay. You then shoot him a third time through a block of ice for no reason except that this would look cool. No reason. Yep. And then that same bullet hits a guy and goes through him? No, that bullet yeah. maybe falls at that guy's feet after you've shot through a block of fucking ice. What were all those blocks hey, of ice? Uh, I'd, hate to, I'd hate to come to the defense of a movie, but in that scene, he fired two shots in succession. Yeah. And the first one went through the ice, then fell, and then the... Second one went through the hole that the first one made, and then went through his chest. Okay. Okay. Pay attention to this one stupid aspect of the film, and at first, at first glance, I'm like, that wouldn't have gone through the ice and also through him. Oh wait, he did make two shots. It's like who shot nice guy Eddie? And it's like, okay, there were two shots. You just didn't he hear the two shots, but there were two. Okay, bullets. but even still, you still shot the guy twice. Okay. And he didn't die. So my takeaway is that the evil that has been unleashed and is possessing people, they can only be killed in proximity to fish. Ooh. So that was the first rule established. That was my idea. Hello. Yes. Uh, and then we have... We have the, the the pirates, the bad guy and the pirates in the giant gold case that is hiding within it the ancient evil to which the pirates rationalize if it's encased in gold, it must be really valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. so then they release the ancient evil and they leave the gold sarcophagus behind. Yes. I mean, it's still solid yes. fucking gold, bitches. I'm taking it. It's still it. gold. It's still fucking gold. Yeah, let's get some hacksaws and chop this fucker up and... We're going partying. But no, so that didn't happen. They, they just, you know, released the ancient evil and the crusty old guy found something. It, it was riddled with stupidity. You know? Yeah. Stupidity even before you realized... Tara Reed was in it. Yeah. Oh, was that the girl with the Tara Reed? Fucking Tara yes. Reed. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's all I have on this week's film. If anything, it was too much. You know? But we are nearing the end game here. Where the next, the next few weeks are going to be the worst of the worst. And with that in mind, I am so happy to announce that next week, okay. 
Uh, for the podcast, I'm going to be hanging out, hanging out, hanging out with my family. Yes! Having ourselves a party. Just hanging out, hanging out, hanging out with my family. Having ourselves a party. So everyone better have a coat hanger next week. Because next week, we're doing one of my favorite bad movies of all time. We're Titanic, Shock, and Terror. Oh, see, oh. here I thought you were going to do back out of abortion. Okay. Okay. Nice, nice uh, clothes hanger reference. We have never done Birdemic before. Never. Yeah, that just amazes me. And I'm so excited to finally do it. Ah! So excited. Eleanor, I got you. Here. Move over, Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Move over. Because now there's Birdemic. These birds explode. Marker. So. It's even scarier than Alfred Hitchcock. Super excited. Ah! Uh, it'll be on the shared cough cough in like, I don't know, 20 minutes for you. Okay. Best ever. Great acting. Great CGI. Oh my goodness. It's like you're right there with the birds. Uh, great, uh, totally realistic gunshots. Uh, and you'll never look at close hangers the same way again. Oh man, such a great movie. The acting is top notch. I'm so excited to be doing this movie. That is next week. But now that I'm looking back at this week, man, I lost my notes. Uh, there they are. The ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. Norman Fell, Christian Slater. Uh, Turkish propaganda. CM Punk? I gotta say, I think that this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast. This Very has good. been a damn good episode of the podcast. Good, 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 because I, I feel the same way, but I didn't want to say anything because you're the person who makes that distinction and not me, and I didn't want to step on your toes. But yes, I concur with your decision good sir so until next week I am Bunny Williams and I am Reverend Steve and on behalf of Eleanor and Natasha and Maxwell and Bella and everyone else I just want to say thanks for listening and we will see you next week you godless heathens and you do swap us and poop each other and you crap butts. And you crap butts? Crap butts. Crap butts. Okay. Crap butts. Yes, Eleanor? Cookies. Cookies. Okay. <laughs> do 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 do